IoT stick can communicate with LocoNet or OpenLCB via interface or Wi-Fi and MQTT. But what can it actually do with that information? That depends on the function head that is connected on the right side of the IoT stick. In this video I am showing you what you can do with the yellow hat CTC panel module. Welcome to IoTT, I am Hans Tanner. The initial idea for the yellow hat goes back to video number 9 where I used a cheap poster picture frame to build a CTC panel for my test layout. With that use case in mind, the main peripherals of the yellow hat are input buttons and the chain of NeoPixel LEDs. So, here is a list of the key features of the yellow hat. First, it has four groups of eight analog digital input lines to connect buttons or potentiometers. Each group features a 12 pin connector, so four pins are used for 3.3 volts and ground, while the middle eight pins are for the inputs. The LED output pigtail connects to a three wire LED chain using the typical JST connector to drive up to 525 LEDs. This is the same design as used for the blue hat from video number 44. The yellow hat is connected to the IoT stick using the 8 pin hat connector, which is used for communication and power supply. The 6 to 12 volt DC power jack can be used to supply up to 3 amps to the LED chain and provide the 5 volt power to the IoT stick. So, like the blue hat, the yellow hat can be used to power the IoT stick, and in the other direction, the IoT stick USB power can be used to supply a limited number of LEDs without external power supply. The input buttons are programmable to send switch or signal commands as well as block detector or power messages. They also can send analog values so that they can be used for example for brightness control of lights and so on. The buttons also support true dual mode operation, for example to implement route activation with origin and destination buttons. The button sampling rate is about 20 Hz, so they can support button down and up as well as double click messages. The LED chain is similar to the blue hat except that the chain length is limited to 525 LEDs. The LEDs are programmable to display block detector status, turnout position, signal aspects, layout power status, button activity and analog inputs. The LED colors and display modes like static or blinking can be configured individually for each LED using the configuration web page. The typical LED chain refresh rate is 20 Hz and there is also a fully programmable onboard LED number 0 for testing purposes. The yellow hat can communicate via LocoNet or OpenLCB depending on the communication interface connected to the other side of the IoT stick. And of course communication via Wi-Fi using MQTT is also supported, as always with the IoT stick. Let's first have a look at the hardware and then see how to configure the LEDs and buttons of the yellow hat. You may ask yourself, how can this be? Reading 32 input buttons and drive more than 500 LEDs when the IoT stick only has 3 data signals that connect to the yellow hat? Well, looking at the yellow hat schematics, this becomes clear immediately. Right in the center we find an Atmega 328P processor that acts as the head controller. The data lines of the stick are connected to analog pins 4 and 5 of the Atmega and if you have experience with Arduino programming you now know that I am using the I2C interface for the communication between the IoT stick and the yellow hat. And it also becomes clear why the number of LEDs is limited to a little more than 500. Each pixel uses 3 bytes for RGB data, so the limitation comes from the 2 KB SRAM amount of the 328P processor. Other than that, the schematic is similar to the blue hat. We find a buck converter module and the onboard NeoPixel. Six IO lines of the 328P are used for the input buttons. Four of them are address lines and two are used as enable signals for the two analog multiplexer chips we see on pages 2 and 3 of the schematic. And as you see, the signal line from each MOX 
which carries the voltage of the currently selected button input does not go to the 328P but feeds back directly to the third available IO line of the IOTT stick. Therefore, to read a particular button input, the IOTT stick sends a channel select command via I2C to the 328P, which then sets the correct address and enable levels to the MOX, and in the next step, the IOTT stick reads the analog level of the selected input via the analog input line and interprets it either as analog signal or button activity. Note that the input pin of the IOTT stick is using the built-in pull-up resistor. So if nothing is connected to the input, it goes high, which means button up or maximum value if set to analog input. And to activate a particular button, it needs to be connected to ground. This concept makes the inputs quite flexible. Basically, you can connect any type of sensor with a digital output that is open collector, in other words, that is capable of driving the output low when activated. So if you really wanted, you could connect a bunch of NCEBD20 current sensors to it, configure the inputs to send block detector messages and voila, the yellow hat would be a 32 channel block detector module and the status of each channel could be conveniently displayed using the LED chain. The components fit on a 50 by 50 mm four layer board with the head connector right at the edge, so the IOTT stick can be connected. The LED pigtail is on the other side next to the DC power plug. Four 12 pin connectors allow for connecting four ribbon cables that can easily be spliced up to connect buttons and potentiometers as needed. That's for my prototype board, but I am currently working on the next revision. There will be some minor bug fixes to the circuitry, but most importantly, I am going to make the board about one inch longer, so it will be roughly two by three inches. This allows me to turn the head connector around and place the IOTT stick on the top side of the board, but largely within the board perimeter. Even though a little larger, this change will make the yellow head look more compact and more importantly, the IOTT stick will be much better protected against involuntary disconnection. At this point, I expect that the yellow head will become available in the Tindy shop in about three weeks and I certainly will announce it in a future video. So it is a good idea to subscribe to the IOTT channel and click the bell icon so that you are in a premium seat when new videos become available. Let's now have a closer look how the LEDs and buttons can be configured. Of course, as the yellow head is just another module for the IOTT stick, all configuration is set using the web interface and the basic setup for Wi-Fi remains the same. Check video number 42 for details. The only thing that is specific to the yellow hat is that you have to select it from the hat module list on the node configuration page. Once the yellow hat is activated, you will get two additional tabs in the web browser. The first one is for the LED chain setup. It is identical to the LED setup of the blue hat module, so please check video number 44 for details. The second one is for configuring the input buttons and analog inputs. Now, before I explain the input button setup, let me explain how inputs work in general. Let's start with the example of a block detector. As soon as a locomotive enters the block, it gets triggered and sends out an occupancy message. That's nice, but it does not change anything. There needs to be another node that receives that message and takes some action. This could be an ABS signaling system that sets signal aspects based on block occupancy. Or it could be a CTC panel that simply displays the occupancy status of a track section. Or it could be a JMRI script that accelerates or decelerates a locomotive based on this information. So there is always a sensor that creates a message and one or several other nodes that use that information to do something else. This basic mechanism is what OpenLCB calls a producer-consumer model. If you want to read more about it, there is a link to an OpenLCB article in the description below. 
The real important thing to understand is that there is a so-called M to N relationship between producers and consumers. A message sent by one producer can be consumed by an indefinite number of consumers. And a particular consumer can receive messages from an indefinite number of producers. And the other important fact is that a particular node can be producer and consumer at the same time. There is only one difficulty though, and that is that not all nodes necessarily speak the same language. For example, a switch decoder may only react to switch commands. Therefore, it does not know how to handle a block detector message. Not even to mention button messages, which were not even defined when the switch decoder was manufactured. To deal with these problems and maintain a proper producer-consumer relationship, I made the button system a two-step system. Thereby, the button inputs are simple producers that generate messages based on their own internal status without consideration what the message is being used for. And the second step is an intermediate consumer producer node that listens to the button messages and translates them to the messages that the final consumer can understand. So for example signal or switch messages and so on. With all that in mind it becomes clear that the button setup process is a two-step approach and the hardware button setup tab takes care of the first step. So let's have a look at the configuration tab. The basic settings part is for settings that affect all buttons connected to the yellow hat. The hold threshold defines the time delay a button status message is repeated when a button is continuously pressed. The double click threshold defines the maximum time between two button activations to be considered as double click instead of two individual clicks. And the board base address field allows you to change the addresses of all buttons of the yellow hat in one single step. Just enter the address of the first button, then click OK on the confirmation dialog and all buttons will be renumbered. The first button will have the given address and then the address is incremented by one for each button. Note that even after using this option, you can always go ahead and change the address of individual buttons as you like. The button configuration part lets you make specific changes to each individual button. The port number column identifies the pin on the yellow hat that provides the input signal for the respective line. The hardware button type drop down selector lets you choose how this input should be used, either as button or as analog input or deactivated. The button address field lets you specify an individual address for each button that will be used as sender address when a message is sent. Valid values are in the range from 0 to 65535, which should be enough for most layouts. In general, it is a good idea to make sure each button has a unique address. However, it is possible to have several buttons, even on different DLO hats, to use the same sender address. There may be use cases where this is beneficial. In analog mode, the input line sends an analog message whenever the value changes by more than 5% compared to the previously sent value. This threshold is intended to limit the number of messages being sent in case of an input signal with a slight oscillation, which is not uncommon for analog sensors. When configured as digital button, there are five different button messages that are sent based on the activation status. If you have some experience writing Windows applications, this probably sounds familiar. When you press the button, it sends a button down message. When you let it go, it first sends a button up message followed by a button clicked message. When you repeat the process within the specified double click threshold time, the process repeats but this time there is a button double click message instead of the button click. And if you keep the button pressed, it continues sending button hold messages every time the button hold threshold timer expires. The input status field shows the current button status in real time. So when you press the button, you will see the field change color and the text shows the last status. 
You can use this to identify the button in case you don't remember how you connected it. If it is set to analog and the potentiometer is connected to the input line, the analog value is displayed and the color of the field is changing from blue to hot red based on the analog value. The recommended value for the potentiometer, by the way, is 2 kilo ohms. Finally, the send message checkboxes let you specify which of the possible messages are actually sent to the network. Remember that button messages signal events, so if you take action based on a status, you should select messages needed to let the consumer know about the status change. In other words, in most cases you should at least select button down and button up. And if you plan on using two button inputs, which I will explain in a minute, you should also select button hold. When done, you click save and restart at the bottom of the dialog and your choices become permanent. That's it. Your button activities are now sent to the network, so we now should think about what to do with them. This brings us to the button handler module, which has been part of the IoT stick software since video number 32, but with the yellow button actually now becomes really useful. To activate it, go to the node configuration tab and click the button handler option. After save and restart, your browser shows a new tab labeled Button Handler Setup. Click on the tab to open the configuration page. Before I show you some configuration examples, let's just remember that the producer-consumer model is an M to N relationship. This means that the button handler can act on messages from anywhere in the network. They do not have to come from the yellow hat the button handler is actually running on. In fact, the same button handler can handle button messages from many different sources, as long as they have unique button addresses. Well, it even can handle messages from two different physical buttons using the same address. It then just does not know from where the message is coming. For the button handler, it is the same in that case. This may be a useful setup variant if you want to control the same action from two different locations. For example, if you want to have emergency stop buttons on various locations in the layout room and all bringing the track power to idle mode. Ok, back to the setup screen. It is actually quite simple and somewhat similar to the LED setup screen covered in video number 44. Each line in the table is an individual action script for what needs to be done when the speci specified event occurs. The event is described on the left side part of the table, while the right side has the action list. The manipulator buttons work exactly the same way as the ones in the LED chain setup. Use them to add or delete lines or to move lines up or down. There is one new functionality though, which I will add to the LED configuration screen as well. If you hold the control key down when clicking the plus symbol, it will not only create a new line, but it will actually duplicate the entire content of the line, including all defined commands in the action list. This greatly accelerates the work if you have multi-command action lists that are similar to each other. The first data field has the button number to be watched by this line and the drop down selector lets you select the event that should be displayed. Note that each event can have its own command list. The drop down list only selects which one is displayed in the editor on the right side. So for example you can use the button down event to activate a relay and the button up event in the same line to switch it off. On the right side you specify the action that needs to happen when the event occurs. Also here you can use the manipulator buttons to create, delete and move individual command lines. In each line you pick the desired event type, either a switch or signal command, an input report message or a power status message. In the address field you can enter the address of the device you want to operate. Note that as we have seen before there is an offset of 1 for switch addresses. If you enter address 1, 
it will operate what is known to the DC system as switch number 2 and so on. In the second line you select the data that should be sent. This line depends on the selected event type, so for example thrown, closed or toggle for the switch, or the aspect value for the signal and so on. The delay field finally defines the time the button handler waits before the command line is executed. This allows you to slow down the execution of the entire command list to a reasonable cadence. Like in the real world, if you set a route of say 5 switches in a yard, they are typically not operated all at the same time, but one after the other. By setting a delay between two command lines, you can achieve the same behavior. Note that setting even long delays is non-blocking. This means if one or more other command lists are triggered while the first is still under execution, the next one will start immediately, so the two lists will be executed simultaneously. Let's do an example here using my CTC panel. I have four buttons configured for button numbers 141 through 144 as shown here on the button configuration screen. And as you can see, they are in a pretty random order with respect to the input lines, as I did not pay attention when wiring them. And honestly, why should I when everything can be configured in software? Now, I want to use them to toggle the corresponding switch every time I press the button. So in the button handler setup, I create a line for each button and add a switch toggle command with the related switch address and set the command to toggle. And I do this for the button down event as I want it executed when I press the button. If I added it to the button up event, it would be executed when I release the button. I now save and restart and my buttons are ready to operate the four switches as desired. There is one more field in the button selector field list that I have not explained yet. It is an additional button address field and it allows you to implement two button operation. Note that this additional address field is only displayed when you select the button down or the button hold event. Depending on the selected event you make it a directional or non-directional two button operation. A non-directional execution is when the command sequence gets executed as soon as two buttons are pressed, independent of which one came first. For example, you have a safety critical action and you want to make sure it does not get triggered by accidentally pushing just one button. So you make it a non-directional two button operation. To do so, you enter the addresses of the two buttons in the fields before and after the event selector drop-down list and select the button hold event. Now you enter the commands you want to execute when both buttons are pressed. Finally, you need to make sure that both button addresses are used somewhere in the button handler as the primary address. If this is not the case, you simply create an additional line and enter the button address in the primary address field. This is necessary because it creates a variable that keeps track of the button status. You click save and restart and that's it. Your command list will execute as soon as both buttons are hold down simultaneously. In the next example we set up a directional execution, which means two buttons are pressed simultaneously but the executed command list depends on which button was pressed first. To do so, I enter the address of the button that I want to be pressed first in the field on the right side of the drop-down list and the address of the button that triggers the action goes in the field on the left side. Then I select the button down event and enter the commands I want to have executed. In the next line, I swap the two addresses and add another command or list of commands to be executed. Again, this is the list that is executed when I hold down the button specified on the right side and then click the button specified on the left side of the event selector drop-down box.
Here is a more practical example for the same. On my CTC panel I have buttons next to each track in each yard. What I want to do is setting routes including signals to go from one track to the other by just pressing the buttons of the two tracks. First the destination, then the origin. So looking at the track plan we are talking about eight different routes each with individual switches and signal settings. The command lists are very similar. Basically I set first all signals in both directions to aspect zero. Then I set the switches to the right position and then I set the signals either to track speed or slow depending on the switch positions. To speed up the process I define the first route then create copies of it and just change the signal addresses, aspects and switch positions as needed. And here we go. Two hand selection of routes with correct signal settings using destination and origin buttons. Ok, that's it for the overview on configuration options of the yellow hat. You see, it is a relatively simple module, but it offers quite some flexibility for making prototype-like CTC panels. As with the blue hat, I plan on making more videos with configuration examples once the device is available. Check the IOTT webpage for more information. you find it in the IOTT stick yellow hat section. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you. If so, please click the like button below. If you do so, you help to promote this video as well as the IOTT channel in general. Because YouTube algorithms like the likes. Thanks for watching and see you next time.